Edinburgh has long links with the past, but lives very much in the present as a centre of government, education, banking, commerce and industry. Its beauty and romantic history attract visitors from all over the world. Edinburgh was born in the hills. High up on Arthur's Seat, survival of volcanic eruptions and ice age erosion, colonies of primitive people clustered together for protection in prehistoric days beside Dunsappy Loch. The old town emerged slowly below the castle on its rugged rock, and by 1750, the population of 50,000 were huddled together within protective walls. Tenements rose, story upon story, to a height unique in these days among the cities of Europe. Rich and poor lived cheek by jowl. Ever-increasing congestion led to dreams of a new town. Bold and original conceptions turned dreams into reality and brought into being a suburb whose wide streets and gracious mansions contrasted vividly with the towering tenements of all recent. Charlotte Square is the architectural gem of Georgian Edinburgh. It seems incredible today that the deuce burghers of the old town had to be tempted to build in the new by the offer of site at a nominal fee. In some cases, an apple a year. The fishwife with her loaded creel was for many years a regular caller at the grand houses of the new town. Now, only a handful carry on the trade. Today, with half a million inhabitants, Edinburgh has reverted to multi-storey flats. No longer tall, dark warrens, but massive skyscrapers. Before the new town could be fully developed, the Nordloch, dividing old from new, had to be drained. Waverley Station was built on reclaimed land under the new North Bridge. Bridges and long stairs are a feature. As in other capitals, there are monuments everywhere. On Colton Hill stands the unfinished memorial to Scots soldiers killed in the Napoleonic Wars, and near it, the tower commemorating Nelson's victory. The Melville Column dominates St Andrew's Square, which, built in 1772, soon became the centre of banking, insurance and commercial interests in Scotland. This square is still said to be one of the richest in Europe. Four of Scotland's five banks have their headquarters in Edinburgh. St Andrew's House, comparatively modern, is the headquarters of Scottish government departments. The city's population includes over 7,000 civil servants. The government is one of the largest employers of labour in the city. Edinburgh is regarded mainly as a commercial centre, but amid the steeples and the chimneys are many flourishing industries, old and new. Brewing and whisky blending are traditional. Brewing was started by the monks of Holyrood hundreds of years ago. Today, there are 15 breweries in operation. For many years, Edinburgh has been one of the country's principal printing centres, highly skilled craftsmen producing fine books and superb maps. The first printing press in Scotland was set up in Edinburgh in 1507. Industrial printing keeps pace with modern packaging needs. Paper making and printing go hand in hand, and the production of wire cloth and of every other kind of equipment needed for paper manufacture has been developed on a large scale. Engineering, both mechanical and electrical, plays an important part in Edinburgh's industrial output. One firm turns out monster electrical transformers. Another develops a device for catapulting aircraft from carriers. Ships and the stabilizers that have made sea voyages more pleasant for passengers are built at least.
firms have adapted their output to meet modern requirements. The production of cathode ray tubes at a glass works is a recent development. Other new industries include the manufacture of sutures, plastics, and nuclear equipment. The electronics industry has expanded rapidly. In this practical application, a milling machine is controlled by a tape recorder. For long, the rubber industry has been one of the city's main sources of employment. Today, production is concentrated largely on the manufacture of tires for heavy transport vehicles and of rubber hoses for many of them. Shortbread is only one of many Scottish foodstuffs produced for the world market. And the textile industries, particularly the production of hosiery, also flourish. Perhaps Edinburgh's most important industry is the intangible one of education. The university, founded in 1583 as the Town's College, has a role of over 7,000 students and is planning to provide for 10,000. The university has six faculties, and its medical school is renowned throughout the world. Edinburgh University is second only to London in the number of overseas students taking courses, one in every six coming from abroad. Feeding the university are many notable schools, some hundreds of years old. George Herriot, goldsmith to James VI of Scotland and first of England, left his wealth to found this school, which was completed in 1659. Cromwell made it his headquarters when besieging the castle. Donaldson Hospital was set up to assist deaf and dumb children. Daniel Stewart's college is typical of the merchant company schools. Fetty's College, a public school of the English type, was founded by a former Lord Provost of the city. These foundation schools have made a major contribution to Edinburgh's reputation as an educational centre. New schools built by the corporation arise almost overnight. Their modern designs contrast sharply with the character of the older schools, but reflect fitness for purpose. Culture is not neglected. Art lectures take on a new significance before the treasures of the National Gallery. Tintoretto's also do. El Greco's St. Jerome. A Degas portrait. Gauguin's vision after the sermon. Tiepolo's great work, The Finding of Moses. Edinburgh has always been a popular holiday resort, but since the war, largely as a result of its international festival, it has become a major tourist centre. Whether the visiting thousands come by rail, by air, or by road, they invariably turn up in Princess Street. Named in honour of George Force and his brother, Princess Street, hub of the city's life, has a superb situation, claimed by some to be the finest in Europe. Visitors sometimes revel in brilliant sunshine, sometimes shiver in snell wind. Princess Street has something for everyone. The Royal Scottish Academy reveals the latest trends in art. The Scott Monument recalls Sir Walter's attachment for mine own romantic town. The gardens provide entertainment for some and refuge for the weary. In the West Gardens, the floral clock, first of its kind in the world, is the centre of attraction. These gardens, 
sheltering below Princess Street and the castle provide the city's second promenade, meeting place for visitors and citizens alike. its majestic rock is the greatest magnet of all. Its story is romantic and stormy. In wars with the old enemy, the English, it changed hands many times. James VI, destined to become first king of a united kingdom, was born here. Statues of Wallace and Bruce, flanking the main entrance, recall Scotland's bitter battle for independence. The oldest part of the castle is the tiny Norman chapel built over 800 years ago by King Malcolm's saintly wife, Queen Margaret. The newest building is the National Shrine, austere memorial to Scots, wherever they may have come from, who fell in two world wars. Thousands come yearly to pay homage at the shrine, which stands on the highest point of the castle rock. Nearby, in the crown room, are the honours, symbols of the days when Scotland was a sovereign power. The crown, made of Scottish gold, dates back to 1540. The sceptre was presented to James IV by Pope Alexander VI. The sword of state was a gift from Pope Julius. Mons May, beloved of children, could hurl one of its huge cannonballs over a mile was made in the 15th century. Every vantage point in the castle provides a magnificent panorama over the city, to the fort, to fight beyond, and to the distant mountains. Moon battery echo down the royal mile linking castle and palace. Mary, Queen of Scots, and Bonnie Prince Charlie passed this way. St. Giles Cathedral, with its lovely crown shaped steeple, was the scene of many historic incidents. Here, John Knox thundered on behalf of the Protestant faith and against the Catholic Queen Mary. Here, Edinburgh housewives started the revolt which led to the signing of the National Covenant. Beside the cathedral are Parliament Square and the Law Courts of Scotland. The Scottish Parliament met here until the union with England in 1707. Further down High Street, not far from St. Giles, stands the house where John Knox lodged. There today as it was in his time, typical of the quaint architecture of the old town. The narrow closes of the high street recall traditions and trades of bygone days. Advocates clothes, flesh market clothes, world's end clothes. The last before the burghers of Edinburgh entered the adjoining borough of Canongate. 